it's always fun to come to these Becker Friedman talks, um, in large part because Gary was a good friend, and uh, we've talked. To, Gary and I actually talked about this problem uh, over the years. We we once wrote a paper with with Kevin on re on related topics, and that was several years ago. Um, this is uh, somewhat different than the kind of stuff I talked about uh, with Gary, but I want to I want to approach it in kind of the way that Gary would, and just use some basic economics. It's not going to be a bunch of math, but, I re but I've, I've reserved my opportunity or my right to have graphs. So you'll get to see some graphs that look like the things that you saw in, in class. And it's an important uh, um, uh, policy, uh, policy problem. I called it dismal economics because, not, not because I, I've come up with some solution or denied the efficacy of other, some other solution. Um, but rather, I want to understand p people's attitudes towards uh, policy interventions that might be dealt with, uh, that might deal with climate change, especially those that are most often ad advocated by economists, and that's a, that's a carbon tax. So uh, let's get, get rolling. So here's the question before us. Um, science and empirical evidence indicate that greenhouse gases are, affect the climate. And that can, they can impose possibly serious costs, even catastrophic costs, um, in some calculations on, on future generations. So that, that, that gives rise to a concept called the social cost of carbon. And the social cost of carbon, it, it, it's, 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 it's a cost imposed both on current generations, and but mainly on future generations, from current consumption of, uh, of, of goods and services that emit greenhouse gases. So the, the US government estimate by an intergovernment, intergovernmental uh, panel that sought to, 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 est to put a number on it is a social cost of carbon of $41 a ton. Now that measures the present discounted value of harm worldwide, all generations, from emitting another ton of carbon into the atmosphere. So in the United States, that's about $280 billion a year, which is about 10% of federal spending. And so it's a good idea to keep that kind of number in mind. Um, I'm not going to vouch for the $41, but I'm going to use the $41 in some calculations later. Um, if, if, if you feel like it, you can go and have a look at the way it was calculated or the summaries of the way it was calculated. Um, I wouldn't even call it an estimate because there's no standard error band on it. It's kind of a calibration that came from some models. And you can admire the models at your leisure. We're just going to take it as given for today. Um, yeah, a fact before us is that fossil fuels, that's what the FF stands for, are cheap and plentiful. So successful mitigation is going to require some, some policy interventions, barring uh, miracles or technological breakthroughs that would not be induced by policy. Um, policy interventions to date have been um, fairly feeble and toothless. If you read the Paris Accords on what our commitments are, to summarize, our commitments are none. Um, although we've said that we've, we've committed to things, there's no, there, are, there are no repercussions if, if we don't, if China doesn't, if Uganda doesn't. Um, now, the economists have a favorite tool for dealing with for a problem like this, because it's an externality. It's a cost imposed on others, mainly future generations, by our activities today in burning fossil fuels. And our, our, our favorite tool is a carbon tax. It's not been widely adopted, and it remains unpopular among a significant part of the population, especially in the, in the United States. So why is that? Is it ignorance on people's part of the consequences, or could it possibly be rational? What got me thinking about this was that when, I, when, it, when you talk to people who are opposed to these kinds of things, and they tend to be more from the political, call it the political right, and then you talk to people who are in favor of active policies, and they're more likely to be on the political left. But I never noticed that there was any deeper knowledge of the science of climate change on either half of the political spectrum. But 
the people on the right tended to be concerned about the size, scope, and growth of government, and the people on the left seem to be less concerned. In fact, they might want to have a larger government. And I tried to, I'm going to see if I can kind of frame that division of opinion and, and the, the people's attitudes towards policy a little bit within that, within that, um, within that context. So we're going to try to use a little, Gary, this is why the connection to Gary, I want to use a little bit of price theory like we teach in, what, what's the number of the course, 301, whatever it is around here, um, to, to figure this out. So, so let me say something about the target. And this is a slide that summarizes some stuff that I swiped from my, my co-teacher, uh, David Weisbach from the law school. So our, our commitment to cut emissions, the US commitment, made in the context of Paris, is to cut emissions from, by 80% from our 1990 levels by 2050. Now, what does that mean? So here's, here, here's some data on uh, US annual emissions. I don't see my US annual emissions. Uh, uh, in 2008, they were about six gigatons from the United States per year. In 1990, they were about five. The target is 20% of the 1990 level. So that comes out, if you do the calculations, to about 3.2 tons per person by 2050. Now, you might want to ask, when was the last time we were in the neighborhood of 3.2 tons of carbon emissions per person in the United States? Well, you know, in 1975, we were at 20. So that's a long way from 3.2. And then in 1950, we had the first jet engine flight. It was, in, it was around 16. Back in 1925, or almost 100 years ago, it was 15. 1910, we came out with a Model T Ford. Well, it was 14. 1900, it was 8.7. We're still not there. 1890, the first Tesla generator. This was not Elon Musk. Uh, 6.4, somewhere between 1870 and 1880, we were, at, we were at around our target for getting to 2050. So the point there is we got a long way, we got a long way to go. And one of the tools in the toolkit is, uh, that economists like is this carbon tax I was talking about. So here's some takeaways. Now with widely accepted values of the social cost of carbon, might be too low might be too high. Only a bit of government inefficiency applies that a carbon taxes are not worthwhile. So if your opinion is that there's a lot of government inefficiency, it might not be worthwhile at the current cost of carbon to have a carbon tax. A US tax on oil would generate about $400 in taxes for every $1 of environmental benefit. And then the key question that we'll try to address is, well, what do you do with that $400 per $1 of benefit? Where's it go? How's it spent? And more importantly, maybe, what do pe how do people think it's going to be spent? Because that's the political economy question that, we're trying to, uh, that I'm trying to get at. So it tends, people tend to think that government is very inefficient. I'll give you some numbers in a minute. And likely to expand with a new revenue source. Now, one solution to that that's been proposed in the so-called conservatives' um, uh, uh, approach to cli climate policy by our former Dean George Schultz and uh, Jim Baker, for both former secretaries of state, along with some economists, um, is to hold government constant. So have a revenue-neutral carbon tax where we find some mechanism, some venue by which we're going to give it back so the government doesn't grow to alleviate those, concern, alleviate those concerns of people who are worried about the growth of government. Now, the textbook solution is to set, we'll draw a picture of this in a second, is to set a, a tax on carbon equal to the social cost. And a, a simple setup then would be set a tax equal to $41 per ton. And actually, the, the Baker-Schultz proposal would say set a tax and then take off other regulations, let the market do its thing, and it'll solve this problem to economize on the use of carbon emitting, efficiently economize on the use of carbon emitting fuels. So without an additional tax, um, but, but a, a point that I think people haven't really discussed much 
is that existing tax levels, the tax wedges we have on the consumption of most products, including things like oil and gasoline and coal and all that, exceed the widely accept, already exceed widely accepted values for the cost of carbon. So fossil fuel consumption in an economist uh, metric might already be below the first best efficient level. But even so, even with that, you might say, well, then we don't want to do it. No, that's not right. Even so, with efficient taxation and, and government spending, you don't even need the efficient government spending if you can hold government constant. It's going to, it turns out it's welfare improving to raise taxes on carbon intensive goods. And it's not for the reason you think. So a necessary condition is that existing government is efficient or, and or, the existing tax structure is efficient. And where we're going to get the benefit is by cutting taxes on other things and reducing distortions. So recognition of the social cost of carbon actually reduces the cost, the distortions involved with raising government revenue. So it reduces the marginal cost of public funds. So they, it, and, and to go along with that, the optimal carbon tax is not equal to the, the additional tax is not equal to the social cost of carbon. It's likely to be smaller, um, and I'll go into the reasons for that in a little bit. So, so let, let's think about climate externalities and, and, and Pigouvian taxes. So economists and others think of, of, of anthropogenic climate change as a classic externality problem. So current users of fossil fuels don't recognize the full social cost of their actions. It's not like the chemical factory next to the river or the, the acid rain going up in the atmosphere. It's a key difference, and that is that much of the cost is really falling on future generations rather than a direct cost on my neighbors that I'm not taking into account. And that makes things much more, more complicated. Um, but we're not going to really focus on that intergenerational aspect here. We're just going to take the cost as given. So too much is used, absent some policy intervention, uh, by market participants relative to the efficient outcome. That's the problem. You've got to do something about that. So the, 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 the solution, as I mentioned maybe here, it's a facile solution for economists, is that is to fashion a so-called Pigouvian tax. A lot of people in the room recognize it's named after an old economist from the 30s, Arthur C. Pigou, who might have been a communist spy, but we won't go there. Um, and, and put a tax on fossil fuel use. And it, the tax should be equal to the external cost borne by current and future generations. So in, in effect, what you do there is you, what you acknowledge is there's a missing market. This resource here is, say, the, co the absorptive capacity of the atmosphere to, hold, to safely hold some concentration of carbon dioxide has been unpriced. And so you want to price the unpriced good, and that's what the, that's what the carbon tax will do. So the, 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 then the current users are going to face the full social costs of their actions. They take it into account. They efficiently economize on the use of carbon-emitting products. And all is good. We'll only burn a unit of fossil fuels today if the current value is, is bigger than the full cost, including the social costs. And the outcome would be, in the economist sense, efficient. So, and it sounds really easy. Now, the vast majority of economists favor a carbon tax as the best way forward. It's the best way to mitigate the harm, both now and in the future, from, from uh, fossil fuel use. And if you analyze the way this, this carbon tax ought to behave over time, like the price of an exhaustible resource, you can think of the atmosphere as an exhaustible resource, the price ought to rise over time at the rate of interest. So if it's $41 today, it ought to be $44 next year and so on. So let it rise. It's in, and often people use an interest rate of 3%. Although that's a very controversial number that we're not going to talk about today. So, there are daunting challenges. Gary and Kevin and I discussed this years ago in a paper on, on in implementing a harmonized carbon tax. Now, what do I mean by harmonized? You know, this isn't going to do much good if Ireland does it by themselves, or if, dare I say, British Columbia does it by themselves, because they're very small relative to the magnitude of the problem, and it creates all kinds of complicated substitution opportunities. 
So, but, but, but that's, what, that's what I mean by harmonized. It, has to be, it should be done in parallel across countries. And that's why we need international agreements. So we, the, but the, the, a lot of the problems, among the several problems, estimating the future harm. We're not there. We don't know how it's going to play out. So we use computable gen general equilibrium models and integrated assessment models that bolt a general equilibrium model onto a model of the climate. And we get some numbers. And then, so that, that creates a great deal of uncertainty about what the true costs are. Another one is applying a proper discount rate to future harm. Advocated discount rates vary all over the place. So Sir Nicholas Stern did a giant study for the United Kingdom Ministry of Finance and decided, we won't go into the details, it ought to be about a point and a, one and a half percent. Whereas others would say you should discount at the cost of capital, which is on the more, more on the order of six or seven percent. Now those great give vastly different values for what the social cost of carbon will be. And then different countries are going to value climate investments in different ways. We can think of China and the United States. You know, what, from our perspective, the bad state of nature is that there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and it causes damage to future generations of Americans. And from China's perspective, they're worried about that too, but the state of nature where there's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere happens to also be the one where they got rich. So their willingness to pay for such investments might diverge from ours, which makes agreements, these harmonized agreements, much more difficult. Now those are often challenged uh, as, or offered as reasons for, for, for why uh, we haven't implemented an effective policy and therefore I'm going to ignore them. Um, I'm going to so assume all those problems could be solved. We have a proper estimate today. I'm going to use $41 for the social cost of carbon. And then we're going to talk about the political economy of carbon taxes. Would a carbon tax that's equal to the social cost of carbon uh, provide net benefits? And the answer is maybe, maybe not. Much depends on what is done with the huge amount of tax revenue. And that affects, I think, people's opinions of how to proceed. So that's the political economy of the, of the situation. So here's a graph. Many of you know what this is all about. Of explaining why car economists like carbon taxes. And let me see if I can get this. There it is. You can barely see that. So, um, but maybe the public's not so excited. The ideal Pigouvian tax is to, is to set that tax equal to the social cost of carbon. So absent, absent in the inter intervention, this supply, and I've made it flat because it makes life a lot easier, uh, is equal to mar marginal private cost. And in the absence of any intervention, the market ends up at price. This is a good that emits carbon. The market ends up at price P0. Total amount consumed is Q0. And, but there's an external cost that's not recognized. That's SCC. And so the efficient amount is where marginal value, willingness to pay for another unit of the good, is equal to the true social cost, including the cost imposed on future generations by emitting carbon. And so the efficient quantity is here at Q1, and the price of the product to consumers should be Q1. So in effect, what that means is we're overconsuming. And I think that's, that's we've represented in a graph everybody's intuition that we're over consuming these carbon intensive, uh, carbon intensive products. Now if we put a tax up here of T equal to the social cost of carbon, then you raise the marginal cost to private, to current producers of using the good and the equilibrium will be at Q1. And this was Pigou's solution to the, to the, um, to the, uh, externality problem. Now when you draw that picture up there, I've drawn this picture for years when I'm trying to explain externalities to people. And what struck me about this one is that if I really drew this to scale, oh, let me f stop. And so what's the, what's the social cost of overconsumption? It's this triangle where the marginal, the marginal social cost of a unit 
is bigger than the marginal value to consumers. So if we could move back from Q0 to Q1, we'd gain that triangle B. Now going along with that triangle B is a rectangle G. That's the, that's the increase in government revenue by imposing this, this efficient tax. Now back to what I was going to say. When I draw this thing in class and I'm, in, 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 and I'm explaining externalities, I always, you know, we go through different examples, not typically not carbon uh, pricing. If I drew this to scale, this rectangle, this is a, a geometry theorem that rectangles are bigger than triangles. The, this rectangle would go down like around the hall and down the hall and maybe I'll come all the way back and then the triangle would be what kind of what it is. So, you know, you don't get a real appreciation for the magnitude of the market you're dealing with. It's a big market. We burn a lot of energy that uses carbon. And even if I did, I'm going to do an example for the oil market in a, bit, a minute. So don't be misled by the relative size of those two things. The rectangle is enormous and the triangle is a little guy. Okay? That's important for us to understand. So let's do an example of this kind of thing. I'm going to use a global carbon tax on oil. Now, using higher geometry, I'm going to put this tax on, and I'm going to get this ben triangle benefit B back. That's the, that's the dead weight loss that's eliminated. And that's one half times the tax times the change in quantity from Q0 to Q1. And then I get, the, get this rectangle that's equal to the tax times the amount of stuff that gets consumed, the efficient amount that gets consumed, Q1. So let's think about how big these things are. Well, the tax, here's the tax. How big is the ratio of G divided by B? Well, this change here from Q0 to Q1 is proportional to the elasticities of supply and demand in this market. And the explicit little formula is it's the product of the elasticity of supply and the elasticity of demand divided by the sum of those two elasticities, and then you multiply it by the tax rate. Well, we got some, I got to put some numbers on that to give you a, a feel for magnitudes. So here's the numbers I'm going to use. We're going to use oil. So let's assume that the price of oil is $60. $60 a barrel, that's pretty good. And the tax has to be valued at $41 per ton of emissions, how much carbon emissions come from a barrel of oil, and that'll give us the social cost of carbon embedded in the oil when we burn it. And that turns out to be $12 a barrel. So that's a, that says the little t there, the tax rate, is about 20%, okay? So that's, that's pretty good. And then I need some numbers for those elasticities. So I searched around for information on the oil market. Long run elasticity of demand for oil is about 0.3. Short run elasticity is an itty bitty number. Um, the long run elasticity of supply for oil, the numbers I found were on the order of 0.3. Now those, uh, having a different one, like an infinite elasticity of supply is gonna give us slightly different numbers, but our main conclusion is not gonna really change. So that means that this elasticity of quantity with respect to an imposed tax rate is about 0.15, okay? So if you put for each 1% increase in the tax rate, you'd get 0.15 of a percent reduction in the quantity transacted in this market. So that's given us the magnitude of this reduction here. And then I'm gonna look at the ratio of government revenue from imposing the tax to be the benefits we got from imposing the tax. And if you do it, as a harmonized tax worldwide, and you use our $41 per ton, we collect about $66. With these elasticities, we collect about $66, $67 in taxes for every dollar of benefit. Now, some of you might be saying, well, that's a big number. But we also have to keep in mind that from the point of view of imposing the tax, now I'm shifting back towards a little bit unilateral policy, when we impose a tax in the United States, we collect the revenue, we collect the rectangle in the United States in proportion to how much we consume, but the benefits of having reduced the emissions because the 
the atmosphere doesn't give a damn where the stuff came in from. It's all up there doing its thing. So we only get about, typically these estimates are what's the proportional reduction in GDP or the, the reduction in future GDPs from emitting another ton of carbon in the atmosphere. We account for about 16% of world GDP. So actually the ratio of government revenue to benefits accruing to US folks from paying that tax is a bit over $400 for every dollar of benefit that we get. So the key, politically, the key political economy question is, well, what happens to that G? What, and, it, it's, it, and I'm trying to want, I really want this to be a positive economics, even though it's a bit of political economy. It's, you know, what I care about is what people think about that increase in G, because I think it affects their opinions on how to proceed. So here's a preliminary question. I've asked this several times when I've given earlier, more stripped down versions of this. You know, what, what's your view on how efficient is the government at allocating resources? You think it's more efficient than the private sector, say 110%? It's equally efficient, would be 100. Less than that. How many think it's more efficient? Oh, come on. I, 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 okay, good, good. Now I've, I've always, I've, I've, I've gotten, now I've gotten three that said more efficient oh, in, in the several times I've talked about this related topic. One was a federal employee. One was a University of Chicago scientist who gets giant grants. No. <laughs> and thou. <laughs> okay, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay, you can have that opinion. You can have that opinion. All right, so, but most people, unlike you and the other two guys I was talking about, say, ah, I don't think so. so. So let's look at public attitudes towards the size and efficiency of government. And you might expect there's going to be a partisan divide on this kind of stuff. So this is, a, Pew is a fairly reputable polling organization. And the, when they ask people, what would you rather have? Um, these don't add up to 100 because there's some people say, I don't know. So, whoops. Would you like to have a smaller government with fewer services? You know, on a, and typically, more people say that than say, I'd like to ha have uh, a bigger government with more services. And then you can see how it's distributed across individuals. So people who make over $100,000, it's roughly two-thirds would rather have a smaller government with fewer services. And what I'm trying to get at here is not whether they, they're right, it's just what they believe about the magnitude and scope of government services. Now, you might also ask, what do people think about whether the government's wasteful and inefficient? Well, a lot of them think the government's wasteful and inefficient. And at that, in, in a typical year, substantially more people believe that than believe that government does a, this is an important question down here, government does a better job than given credit for. That means that you might think that other people think it's more inefficient than you do, but you still think it's inefficient. And we'll get back to that, that number. All right, and now here's the political divide. People who uh, vote Republican or lean Republican, boy, most, <laughs> the gap is huge and it's getting, bigger. So there's the partisan divide on what people think the size and scope of government should be and the efficiency of government. And now we'll put some numbers on it. There's a Gallup poll. Because this is the only qu this is a question I asked. But what would you like, question would you like me to ask? We're going to have, we're going there. Okay. That's where we're going. I trust me. All right. But this is what people think. Of each dollar in federal tax revenue, how much is wasted? They also have a sequence of questions uh, on this about your local government uh, uh, tax dollars. And like people's attitudes towards Congress in general versus their own congressmen, they think all congressmen are crooks except their congressmen. And in this, in, in this context, the mean of how much is wasted per dollar is about 51 cents on, on the dollar. 
And again, this is just public opinion on, on, on the role of government, the relative efficiency uh, of government. So uh, I, let's put that, those data kind of under our belt just to give a kind of in atmosphere to, to, to our problem. So how, how pessimistic is this tale? So benefits per dollar of taxation we showed are pretty small. It doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It's, it's, the key question is what's done with the government revenue. And when I say it's not worth doing, I mean in the eyes of people who get to vote and influence these things, what do they think? So a carbon, so two key points I'm going to try to make. A carbon tax equal to the true cost of carbon may actually reduce welfare if the skeptics are right. It might be harmful. And a positive theory of political economy of carbon taxation. It helps us to understand the nature of opposition and support for doing something. Those who think the government should be bigger tend to think doing something is a good idea. And on the other side, those who don't, don't. And that's sort of the partisan divide you, up, you see up there. It's not so much their understanding of the, the physics of, of climate change. It has a lot to do with their views on the political economy of policy. So here's a policy alternative to what, um, to the, the problem I presented in my previous graph. And that's, uh, I'll call it, I call it Baker-Schultz. They called it a conservative case for taxing carbon. And that is, and this comes back to Gene's question, to have a revenue neutral carbon tax tied to dropping other regulations. Okay, now first there's two things in that sentence. Revenue neutral carbon tax, which means you got to, they have to find a way not to give the additional revenue to the government. And then they tie it by, they, to other regulations. Why do they say that? They say that because their faith in markets is such that if you had the right prices, you'd get the right answer, you'd get the efficient answer. So get rid of these other regulations, let markets do its thing, do their thing. Now there's two basic versions of this. The first is return the tax revenue via lump sum transfer. So we tax, the cons we tax consumption, because almost all consumption involves some amount of, 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 um, of, of carbon-based fuels. And we return that revenue via lump sum rebate. So since this is Becker Friedman, we'll call it the parachute drop of money back to people. So you tax the thing and give them your, you give them a parachute drop, drop of the money back. It turns out that for that policy, the benefit of, I should say, if you ask people about this one, they, you know, it kind of sways them a little bit. Oh, you're going to give the money back. And the government's not going to grow, and you know, maybe I'm going to get some of that back. Okay, so this is the one they, they, they're more like, not a lot of, not a huge uh, majority likes this. It's kind of even, but this is the one that doesn't actually work. The benefits are smaller than the, uh, than the cost because current taxes exceed the social cost of carbon. I'll give you some data on that in just a second. Then the other one is to cut other taxes. And this, I think, is what Gene was asking about. This will improve welfare if the existing tax structure is already efficient or optimal. So we've set taxes in the least harmful way to raise a given amount of government revenue. Or better yet, here we'll get a, what some people would call the double dividend. But this is the condition that you need for the double dividend, that the taxes are too high on something. And so you can use this carbon tax as kind of political leverage to make a deal to cut taxes on things that are too high. So Baker and Schultz might refer to the corporate income tax on the, belief, on, on the Alan Greenspan argument that the optimal corporate income tax is zero. So you cut it even from what we have now of 20% down to zero, but the deal would be we're only doing that in the presence of a carbon tax. Now, what that does is it recognizes the social cost, the, the this social cost of carbon but recognition of it reduces the marginal cost of public funds. And to give you the intuition for why that happens, when you raise tax revenue, you're sweeping out consumption where the value of that consumption is bigger than the cost to society of providing it. So if you set a tax structure in the first place, not even looking at the social cost of carbon and it's efficient, then the tax that's on these little gizmos 
to get a dollar's worth of government revenue ought to be equal to the tax on my watch for, for the displaces, it ought to displace the same distortion as the tax on my watch to get one more dollar of government revenue. So you want to minimize the cost of giving a, getting a given amount of government revenue and what's suddenly waking up and saying, oh, there is a social cost of carbon. Well, that something you've been counting as a distortion before really isn't a distortion. So you're getting back, you're reducing the cost of raising funds by taxing things that emit carbon and you can make up for it by taxing things that are less carbon intensive or not carbon intensive and you get a first order gain. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. First thing is, this is actually an important point, I think it's underappreciated. That current tax levels, come back to our, 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 the picture I drew before, which assumed there was no tax. When I put that uh, the other picture up there, I said, there, when I drew it, we started from mar true marginal costs and there was no tax. But you know, all the tax, all the stuff we consume is taxed either directly or indirectly. So the average marginal tax income, rate, in, income tax rate in the US, both state and federal, is somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. I'm going to use 25 to keep it low. The uh, typical value of other taxes on economic activity, say for good A, is, is about 8 percent. Then the wedge, the implicit tax on consumption for good A, is the tax, the direct tax on A plus the income tax rate over one minus the income tax rate, that's about 44%. That's a big gap. That's pretty big. Now come back to what I said earlier. If I put a tax equal to social cost, or if I just looked at the social cost of carbon using $41 per ton, and I chose a good that's pretty carbon intensive, like a barrel of oil, well, that was about $12 per barrel as the social cost of the carbon in the barrel of oil. And the current price is around 60 bucks, so that's 20%. So the wedge is already greater in that sense than the, than the, the social cost of carbon that hadn't been recognized. So exist, existing taxes already exceed typical values for the cost of carbon. Now, if you took somebody else's cost of carbon and said it's $100 a ton or $150 a ton today, well, then you're in a different universe. But for $41, what the Environmental Protection Agency and other U.S. agencies are talking about, we're below. And then the question becomes, do we want to raise taxes even more? Well, maybe, maybe not. It depends, again, on what we do with the additional revenue we would get from imposing the tax. So let's go on and analyze that. So proposal one, raise taxes. This is Baker Schultz one, call it. Raise taxes on carbon emitting things, throw it all in a helicopter, fly around, drop the money back to everybody else so the government doesn't get any more revenue. Now, keep in mind, it's the change in government revenue. So you can't just take the carbon tax revenue. You've got to subtract off from that the revenue that was lost from reduced consumption. But, well, here it is. You raise taxes by, we start from this situation up here where the tax is bigger than the social cost of carbon. So the efficient quantity over here, like if you had lump sum taxes, would be Q efficient. With the tax, we've got QT, Q1, where we end up, uh, 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 when we increase the tax by some amount, de little amount delta T, is over here Q1. So, so what do we get? Well, the loss in surplus from producers and consumers is A plus B. The gain in government revenue is rectangle A minus rectangle C and D. Because that's how much, because you had to take out, you had to net out the reduced revenue on the stuff that you no longer got to tax. All right, so I put them together. Oh, but within C and D, there's this hidden benefit. This hidden benefit, D, is that now we consume less of this carbon emitting stuff. And on every unit, we save the social cost of carbon. So D, the area D up there, is a benefit from reducing consumption. So now the question is, well, did the are the benefits bigger than the costs? Well, we lost A plus B. We uh, 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 
the transfer back is A minus C plus D. When I add them up, I get minus B minus C. It's less than zero. And why is that? Because we started from a situation where the tax, the existing tax is already bigger than the social cost of carbon. So just doing the helicopter drop without doing anything else of value isn't going to get us there. Isn't going to get us a net benefit from putting this tax on. So what else might we do? So my conclusion there, a revenue neutral increase in taxes was just a rebate of revenue is welfare reducing if the existing tax is already bigger than the social cost of carbon. If I changed my picture around and said the existing tax is smaller, so like if I had a $150 social cost of carbon, I'd get a lot more social cost in a barrel of oil, say, and then we'd want to increase the tax, but we'd want to incre keep increasing it up until it's equal to the social cost of carbon in that product. All right, so proposal two. Raise the tax on the carbon emitting stuff and reduce other taxes. Now here's what I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume that, the, as I mentioned a little bit ago, that the existing tax structure is efficient. We took into account all the distortions that we're creating on consumption and, dis and, and decisions of individuals by having these taxes. And we balanced them in just the right way so that the marginal cost of getting a dollar for the government is the same in every place we can try to get the dollar. And that's how you minimize the total cost of funding the government. So suppose we did that. So we've got this tax that up here, the tax is bigger than the social cost of carbon. Now I'm going to raise the tax by that same amount, delta TA, and it creates a marginal distortion. What's the marginal distortion that gets swept out? Well, we used to be getting, we haven't recognized this cost of carbon yet, so the distortion that's being taken into account by the efficient government tax planners is B plus C plus D. The area under the demand curve and above their concept of cost, which is ignoring social cost for the moment, that's the distortion that's created. But now I go over to some other market and call it, call, call it uh, good B over here instead of A. If I'm doing that, I've got to take into account the same kind of trapezoid on good B because that's what I'm balancing. So the marginal cost of public funds is what public finance folks call it is more than a dollar. The cost of getting a dollar for the government is bigger than a dollar. And the difference up there is B plus C plus D, if, you have, if that was how much you'd have to tax to get one more dollar for the government. And you're doing that in good B, and if you're doing it right, marginal cost of public funds on good A ought to be on the same as on good B. I'm doing some simplified envelope theorem stuff here for the math guys. So what does this mean? I'm going to get a tax cut on B, so I'm going to give a tax cut on B so that delta G, the increase in government revenue, is equal to zero. The government doesn't get to grow. So we're going to take the additional tax revenue and we're going to find other places to cut taxes on the assumption that those taxes were efficient in the first place. Well, then what do you really get? Well, the welfare gain on B is the equivalent trapezoid in market B. And it's equal to the trapezoid that was lost before we looked at the social cost of carbon in market A. So those things exactly offset. But then we said, ah, but the reason we're putting this tax on, well, when we raised this tax, we didn't, it didn't actually cost us B, C, D. It only cost us B and C. So since they were offsetting B, C, D in the first market and B, C, D in the second market, we got back D in market A that was emitting the carbon. So there's a first order gain. The first order gain is exactly equal to, for the small increase in the tax, exactly equal to the reduction in quantity times the social cost of carbon. So if you can reduce taxes on other stuff and you start from an efficient level, or better yet, if the tax was above the efficient level, then you'll get a double dividend. It'll be even bigger than this. Then you're going to get a first order gain. Now, the, the, the welfare gain comes because we get an offsetting tax reduction somewhere else. If we had just done the parachute drop to give the money back to folks, that wouldn't have done it. We had to rely here on the efficiency of the tax system to get this first order 
first order benefit from imposing a greater tax in market, in this market uh, that was emitting carbon. So how did that happen? This summarizes what I just said. If taxes are set ignoring the social costs to come of carbon to fund the government, those pre-existing taxes were set that way. Then we wake up and we say, oh, we're, you know, there's, a, there's an externality. But you're not really doing it because it's an externality. You're doing it because collecting taxes from that market now has a smaller distortion than you thought. It reduces the cost of funding the government. And now we're going to use that by, to reduce taxes in some other market, and we get a direct benefit over there equal to what we thought we were going to give up in the first place before we looked at the social cost of carbon. So the marginal cost of public funds is 1 plus MA. If it's efficient, I've got to have MA equals MB. Raising taxes a little bit eliminates costly emissions, and we got more value back by cutting taxes in market B, TB. So it wasn't a double dividend. A lot of people talk about the double dividend. We will, there are circumstances in which you'll get a double dividend, but right now it's a single dividend. We got, the, got back the social cost of carbon by choosing our taxes efficiently. So the intuition is that the discovery of a social cost of carbon reduced the cost of collecting funds for the government in market, markets A that emit a lot of carbon. It's cheaper to raise revenue by taxing A than we thought. The true tax distortion is smaller, so a, tax A more, B less, and go home. But it wasn't about pollution. It's about the lower cost of raising funds for the government. All right, so I want to close with this. Suppose you can do this. Here's a picture of what I just showed you. And you can do all this by thinking of it just like supply and demand. And I got different producers of government revenue. And some of them emit carbon, some of them don't. And then you found out that, so, that the ones that emit carbon really have lower marginal cost of giving you a dollar than you thought. So the supply of sh funds rotates down. It's always bigger than one, but it ain't as big as you thought before. So I've let, whoops, I'm letting V up here be the value of government. How the political economy pays up plays out to get that marginal value of government is another question. But we're just going to think about people have, the political process has some view on the optimal size of government. We started here at G0. If we could reduce taxes on other things in the way I just described, the marginal cost of funding the government went down. Baker Schultz says keep G0 constant. So what do we gain? We gain the reduction in collecting the reduced distortion in collecting funds for the government. So that's our gain in there, and embedded in there is the social cost of carbon and the like. Now, if we really thought that government was efficient, we'd say, oh, but wait, the cost of having a government went down. So now the marginal value of government at the old level of government is bigger than the marginal cost of getting a little bit more government. So in an efficient world, the government ought to grow. And it would grow from G0 to G1. But what we looked at before, and this is where I'll close, was that a lot of people think we're over here at G2. And they don't think that reducing the marginal cost of growing the government is such a great idea because not only going to be a G2, but with lower marginal cost, whatever the political process was, it's probably going to push you farther out here. And then you're way below, the value of government is way below the marginal cost of funding another dollar's worth of government. So if you're a real skeptic, you might think about the value of government, not about climate change. Now you're gonna be a, you can be totally on board. But if you're a real skeptic, you might think you're out here. And then growing the government is not such a good idea because waste is waste is waste. And you've got to balance the waste that uh, is eliminated with the carbon tax against the waste that's created if you use the, car the revenues from the carbon tax in what people perceive to be inefficient ways. So if you think about that number I gave you before, $400 in revenue for every dollar worth of benefit, man, if, the, if G is less than about 99.7% efficient relative to the private sector, then the waste from using them, those additional G dollars is bigger than, if the government keeps the money, 
is bigger than the benefits we receive. And that's the political economy conundrum, I think. So we may think we're at G2 and don't want to reduce marginal co uh, cost of public funds. That might go to make G even bigger. And then restricting growth of G is kind of crucial for making this, making this uh, carbon tax work. So the key points. Most economists and policy makers think the case for carbon taxing carbon is, is obvious. Only public opinion stands in the way, or public ignorance maybe. I, I should say public opinion might stand in the way, but it's not so much public ignorance as it's views people's, people's views on the scope and role of government. Um, the efficiency of taxing carbon isn't clear. If political economy really brought us all the way over there to the right, if government spending is relatively inefficient or government is relatively big, as many seem to believe, then carbon taxes can easily reduce welfare, at least at the level we're thinking about now. And if the government is inefficient, there's a welfare gain from taxing carbon. If G is held fixed, and other taxes can be appropriately reduced. But that's the key phrase, if they can be appropriately reduced. And a positive, as opposed to sort of positive in the sense of what Milton would have said in here, Views on the efficacy of carbon taxation are critically linked to people's views on the relative efficiency of government. That's my message. Thanks for coming. Yeah.